face to talk tonight. Wanna touch the starlight when I go. And if I know the feeling's right, then I found my place to go. Wanna face the dark tonight. The depths of despair I would experience was excruciating. I would plummet to the darkest place I could ever imagine, where emotions bled through my skin. I would isolate myself and drown in the sorrow I was experiencing, crying for light to enter my life. My life would exist in chaos, where I used substances to avoid dealing with the traumatic life events I had been exposed to. I just couldn't sit with my pain absorb every aspect of the desperation and anger that infiltrated my life. I would feel everything and nothing at the same time. I couldn't silence my thoughts. Self-deprecation, anxiety, and psychosis slowly chipped away at me. The only thing that kept me alive some days was using. It was how I survived. When I was 16 years old, I began a very serious daily habit of using crack cocaine. My experience of addiction was largely one of coping with an undiagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder, which made it difficult for me to leave the comfort of my own home and less intoxicated. As a result of my substance use, I was expelled from three different high schools and had lost all hope of graduating and had no sense that I would ever have a career outside of running errands for my dealers in order to support my drug habit. In other words, I had become very nihilistic about my future and had lost my sense of self-worth. The feelings of worthlessness started early in my childhood. I had developed an overwhelming awareness of the size of the world and my relative insignificance in it. My perceived failings shone brighter in the light of others' successes. I felt hideous, worthless, unlovable, wretched. I ruminated on ending my own life daily. I began to cut myself in order to try to sublimate the unbearable inner pain. When I was 12, I began to restrict my intake of food. For once, I had found something I was good at, something I could control and master completely, something towards which I could direct all of my hate and sadness. I'm a perfectionist who not only believed I had to be perfect, I believed I was perfect, or at least that's what I heard. And so for the first 12 years of my life, that was no problem. But then as things got harder and school got harder and there was more competition and I couldn't be perfect, I got overwhelmed and I just dropped out and really stopped caring and got into a lot of bad things and did stuff that I wasn't proud of and that happened for many many years and there was depression and anxiety and a lot of anger and then being in that place and being a perfectionist I didn't like it so where did I go I swung to the other side and ended up being again a top athlete and a, a power lifter and exercising seven days a week but you know, it wasn't a healthy exercise, it was obsessive to where I was lifting crazy amounts of weights and it led to a lot of stress, led to isolation, and a lot of anger. I was 12 years old when I discovered the direct correlation between food intake and weight management. By the time I was 15 years old, I was completely consumed with thoughts of food and an obsession to control my weight. My relationships, my health, and anything else of any importance were all secondary to the relationship I had with my eating disorder. Maintaining my eating disorder meant sacrificing everything else. It meant living in a dark, lonely world full of emptiness and despair. For 17 years, I was locked inside a prison. My eating disorder stayed with me as my near-constant companion for many years. I was hospitalized for malnourishment and anorexia when I was 13. I attended a day program for youth with eating disorders and went through months of refeeding and psychotherapy. Luckily, I met many peers and mental health workers who supported me on my journey. I told myself that I would never go back to that dark place, but it happened again when I was 17. This time it almost took me by surprise. How could I have let this happen again? I was hospitalized again and attended the same day program. I began to realize this was not what I wanted out of life. I wanted so badly the freedom that only health could afford me. I wanted to live my life and not just let it wash over me. 
After months of work, I completed the program for the second and final time. Not knowing where to turn for help, I eventually found my way to the REACH program at CAMH. REACH stands for Recovery and Education for Adolescents Choosing Health. And there, I was able to graduate as an Ontario scholar. When applying to university under the advisement of my case manager, I chose to attend the Bachelors of Social Work program at Ryerson University in the hopes that I could utilize my own experiences of addiction and recovery to assist and support others through the same struggles. At 29 years old, with most of my relationships severed and my health and career compromised, I realized that I had to overcome my eating disorder or it was going to kill me. My eating disorder embraced every opportunity it was given to win back its place in my life. Every day it laid in wait, welcoming me with open arms, promising me false comfort and immediate relief from my struggles. Attending support groups and hearing stories of recovery helped me to see that there could be life without an eating disorder. Letting go of my eating disorder was the most difficult challenge I have ever faced. The pain of the separation, the most horrible endured. It meant walking away from all I knew, accepting sadness, anger and pain, but also joy, happiness and growth. It meant rebuilding broken relationships and processing emotions. It meant becoming a parent. It meant returning to the outdoors. It meant enjoying the simple things like reading a book or playing in the leaves with my son. And the turning point was when my engagement broke up through my anger. I realized I needed to change. If I wasn't going to change, this was going to be the pattern for the rest of my life. So my recovery from being a perfectionist and from, from all of my anger issues was really a process of humility, you know, just realizing that the world did not revolve around me and I was not the center of the universe. And acceptance, acceptance of who I was, that I'm not perfect and that's okay. And I'm just a human being. That sounds so simple, but it was like a 50,000 pound weight lifted off my shoulders to realize that I can just be human. I don't have to be this superhuman person. I knew I was doing this until a better way would present itself. And it did. Ten years of my life, I tried to cope with something I didn't even know I was running from. I finally know there is hope. Also joy, gratitude, and excitement. I feel human again. I do fall sometimes and catch myself migrating back into old thought and behavior patterns. But I can deal with them now and bring myself out of it. Though it was often a dark and painful experience to be addicted, looking back I have no regrets because overcoming it has brought so much meaning and purpose into my life. I have now been abstinent from stimulant drugs like crack, cocaine, and amphetamine for over five years, and I'm excited to be receiving my BSW degree this spring. This experience has certainly caused me to become much more politically aware as an advocate for substance users, who are a woefully underserved community due to many different forms of discrimination and stigma. My story is an example of the importance of funding harm reduction programs for youth. Living with and recovering from an eating disorder also gave me the insight and knowledge necessary to be able to reach out and help others who find themselves in that dark place I knew all too well. Living in recovery does not mean that I will never again have those dark thoughts or those vulnerable moments. And although I may have slips, I will be forgiving of myself and I will continue to practice the healthy coping strategies I have learned. I will remember that I'm a beautiful person deserving of happiness. Living without a eating disorder, I am free to be all that I was meant to be. When I accept myself for who I am and not try to be someone I'm not, and when I remain humble, I'm no better or worse than anyone else, then I'm happy. And that's my process. And so those are the two things that I work on every day, is accepting myself for who I am and being humble. It's been a 20-year journey for me, and I am the happiest and most grounded that I've ever been. With the same intensity and persistence I experience the negative parts of myself, the happiness follows suit. I reach such peaks of elation and pure joy that nothing I ever used and abused could compare. My personal life has actually developed into authentic and genuine relationships. Honesty and trust exist. They are no longer things I seek and I know I'm worthy of so much more than I ever settled for. I'm a survivor. I am the strongest person I know. 
I don't need to self-destruct to survive anymore. I can let my beauty and warmth shine in. Six years later, I still struggle with painful feelings all the time, but I am at a place now where I am able to recognize my strengths, my skills, and my worth as a person. It has taken a lot of hard work, and I am lucky to have had so much support from others. I try to practice gratitude every day and surround myself with people and things that remind me of the beauty that this world has to offer. I now work in mental health and use my experiences to try to help others overcome their own issues. I try to learn new skills and spend my time doing activities that are meaningful for me. Everything that I have been through has made me more self-aware, resilient, and grateful to be alive. This film has been dedicated to the memory of my dear friend Chris. Although Chris did not survive his eating disorder, his death was not in vain. Losing Chris to this terrible disease has given me the inspiration to do what I do today. Chris often spoke of the lack of resources available to those living with an eating disorder, specifically men. It is my goal to work towards changing that. Early intervention and ongoing support are crucial for someone trying to recover from an addiction. It is my hope that day by day, more of these resources can be made available and that with knowledge and education, people can come to see addictions for what they truly are, an illness that can affect people of all ages, all genders, all races, and all classes. As soon as people can see eating disorders and addiction for what they really are, they will see that with the right resources and the right support, recovery can be a reality for everyone. Courage. Won't you come out to play? Come out to play! I'm a living it down again But I'm a bringing it back someday He said, courage Won't you come out to play? You come out to play I'm a living it down again I'm gonna need to call your friends So here's the hope and I find you alone I can throw it